Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has carried out of the number of beds needed in the proposed new Balfour Hospital in Orkney. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. It is the role of NHS boards, in this case NHS Orkney, to develop and implement clinical strategies for the provision of healthcare to their populations and to assess the requirements for the facilities that support uh, these strategies, including the bed numbers required for the replacement Balfour Hospital. Liam MacArthur. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response, which I did catch. Um, she will be aware of concerns that have been raised by me directly and by my constituent, Dr Ian Cunningham, regarding bed capacity at the new hospital in Orkney. The outline business case quoted a potential requirement of 56 beds against the planned provision of 47 inpatient and two assessment beds. Yet calculations carried out by Dr Cunningham on the basis of the figures available from ISD and obtained under Freedom of Information suggest that at the very least the new hospital may be as many as 12 beds short. Will she therefore agree to look again at the assumptions that are being made by NHS Orkney to justify the planned bed numbers? And while reducing average lengths of stays, providing more care at home, greater use of technology and an increased emphasis on preventative care are all very welcome, does she accept that being over-ambitious or indeed unrealistic in the assumptions that are made, or determining bed numbers principally on the basis of cost, is not in the interests of either patients or indeed staff in my constituency. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's important that we get the, the bed numbers right, but also the configuration of the services in general. Uh, so uh, I know, uh, for example, that they are looking at um, the plans for the new hospital to include, as I understand, 49 uh, beds, um, but that the proposed layout will allow a more effective usage uh, of those beds as the current layout limits the usage um, due to the inability, for example, to separate men and women in the existing hospital. So, in essence, the new hospital's layout will allow for um, a better management of bed uh, capacity. That is going to be complemented by an increase from 13 to 42 day case uh, chairs and that NHS Orkney plans to make significant changes to clinical practice prior to the opening of the, the new hospital, which will reduce average stays, reduce admissions and increase the proportion of elective surgery performed as day cases in line with uh, the rest of uh, direction of travel in the rest of Scotland. Uh, but what I can say uh, to the member is that clearly um, the full business case for the project is going to be brought forward later uh, in the year. I think um, they will require to demonstrate that the new hospital will be uh, appropriate to meet the needs of the population and uh, that be before it will receive approval from the Scottish Government. So uh, I will continue to uh, liaise with NHS Orkney, uh, as the local member would expect me to do, uh, and you know, we will um, have oversight to ensure that the new hospital, which I'm sure everyone will welcome, uh, meets the, the needs of the local population. Question number two, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government what plans it has to give boys the HPV vaccination. Minister Murray Mott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Government is advised on all immunisation matters by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. At its meeting on 7 October 2015, the JCVI highlighted the importance of the ongoing modelling work being undertaken by Public Health England and Warwick University to aid its considerations of extending HPV vaccination to adolescent boys. As this is a complex piece of work, the JCVI may not be in a position to provide its final advice until 2017. The Scottish Government will, of course, carefully consider any future JCVI recommendation about HPV vaccination for adolescent boys. Jenny Mara. I'm very grateful to the Minister for her answer. Um, I understand that the, the Joint Commission on Vaccination and Immunisation is doing this work at the moment, and I'm glad that the Scottish Government will take cognizance of this in uh, 2017. But I'm sure she is aware that currently gay men under the age of 45 in Wales are now offered uh, the, the vaccination, but there is evidence that it also should be offered at a much earlier age. Uh, the throat cancer 
cancer diagnosis are due to overtake those of cervical cancer by 2020, according to the Throat Cancer Foundation. So I'm very glad that the Minister has this on her radar and that she will be listening to the um, advice of the, HP, of the Joint Commission on Vaccination and Immunisation. Minister, I'm not sure there was a question there. There was a question there either, presiding officer. I was kind of waiting for it. But um, I'd like to remind Jenny Mara that, of course, the HPV vaccination of girls was introduced uh, in, for protection against cervical cancer. The uptake rates are very high. And, of course, you get herd immunity. There is a particular um, uh, case for uh, uh, men under 45, uh, MSN men attending gum and HIV clinics. Uh, to have the vaccine and the Scottish Government is considering the JCVI's recommendation and we're working with Health Protection Scotland and NHS Scotland to identify potential routes for the delivery of any programme to vaccinate MSN uh, and the cost effective price. Question number three, John Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has with, uh, with local authorities in the Highlands and Islands and Transport Scotland regarding proposed infrastructure projects. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, Transport Scotland officials routinely meet Highlands and Islands local authorities, uh, and these meetings are arranged as required, in addition to a twice-yearly meeting which is held with the Highland Council to discuss major road schemes and strategic transport planning matters. The most recent of these meetings was held on the 9th of December. John Finney. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. Cabinet Secretary from Shetland to Argyll, from Lewis to Murray, harbours, piers, slipways, roads bridges all need repaired and replaced. Um, therefore, many people are surprised that a tra Transport Scotland priority is the A9896 uh, so-called link road. They believe they have made a case for it. Um, this uh, proposed expenditure of about £65 million would mean a one-mile stretch of road going through an area identified in the local plan for a park. It has been dubbed locally as the Mad Mile. Can we get a question? Yes. Uh, would you Cabinet Secretary, you need to personally review that and meet with me to discuss this uh, better use of that sum of money, please. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the member will be uh, unsurprised to learn I do not share his view, and I do not think it is true that local people do either. Uh, the A9, A96 link is a key part of the future infrastructure proposals for Inverness. Its design has been influenced by the current and future demand for housing, employment and aspirations for what is a, uh, Scotland's uh, rapidly growing Highland capital. And the proposed scheme has been part of the Highland Council's infrastructure aspirations to support the continued expansion of Inverness for over 10 years. Without this new link road, there will be a significant impact on the future effectiveness of the trunk road and the local roads in the immediate vicinity. So we will continue to invest uh, in this uh, project to make sure this project happens for the benefit of the future aspirations and the current needs of people around Inverness. Question number four, Gavin Brown. Presiding officer, taking into account uh, Tuesday's topical question to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the condition of the fourth road bridge. Minister, Derek the, fourth, the fourth road bridge opened to vehicles except HGVs from the 23rd of December after the completion of temporary repairs. New state-of-the-art monitoring equipment in the form of electronic strain gauges and tilt meters have been installed on the bridge. And these are continually monitored, and since traffic has been introduced to the structure, they remain within acceptable parameters. A permanent repair to allow HGVs across the Force Road Bridge will commence in the coming days, and subject to favourable weather conditions and no further defects being identified, <coughs> the bridge will reopen to HGVs in mid-February. Gavin Brown. Thank you. In 2012, the Force Road Bridge capital budget got chopped in half. Uh, looking at next year's budget, the capital maintenance budget suddenly sees an 80 per cent increase. Bearing that in mind, was chopping it in half for four years a mistake? Minister. As ministers have said repeatedly, the fault that has occurred was not predicted. The works that have been undertaken are um, fulfilling our obligations around the bridge, will continue to take place and will allow all traffic over the bridge, as has been stated by Scottish Government. Question number five, Alex Ferguson. Can we have Mr Ferguson's mic? Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what criteria need to be met before Transport Scotland undertakes safety upgrades where rural roads intersect with trunk and other major roads. 
Minister Derek Mackay. A criteria is in place to assess the safety performance of the trunk road network on an annual basis. Transport Scotland screen all locations on the trunk road network where three or more personal injury accidents have occurred in the preceding three-year period or where a section of road has had an accident rate of 1.25 times above the nav national average for that road type over the same three-year period. Further investigations are then carried out and where appropriate mitigation measures are prioritised and installed. Alex Ferguson. Well, I'm grateful to the Minister for his answer. The Cree Valley Community Council in my constituency has, has become increasingly concerned about the safety of the road junction where the A712 meets the A75 trunk road just outside Newton Stewart. As he will be aware, the A75 carries a huge percentage of heavy goods vehicles and the A712 a large number of timber lorries. Local opinion is, a, is that this junction constitutes a major accident waiting to happen, yet all approaches to Transport Scotland are met with a response that says effectively no fatal accident history, so no action. Would the Minister agree that it is time that local opinion in these circumstances is given more weight by Transport Scotland, especially when endorsed by elected representatives from all parties and at all levels? Minister. Uh, Mr Ferguson asked me about the criteria which I've given, but I could go on to say, of course, we always look at specific localised circumstances as well to see if there are any other interventions that can be made. I think it's right to target resources to where they can make the biggest difference, and road safety is a very serious uh, issue. But, of course, I'm very happy to look at individual circumstances to understand them more fully, and if the member writes to me, then I'll look at those circumstances. Question number six, Bob Doris. To ask the Scottish Government how it supports unpaid carers in Glasgow. Minister Jamie Hepburn. Uh, this Government recognises and values the vital contribution that unpaid carers and young carers make to the lives of those they care for in communities across Scotland, including in Glasgow. That is why we have introduced the Carers Bill, which is now past stage two of the parliamentary process. The Bill is an important part of our programme of health and social care reform, which will extend the rights of all adult carers and young carers across Scotland, ensuring that carers can be supported in their caring roles. Other Scottish Government initiatives, such as the Voluntary Sector Short Breaks Fund, the Young Carers Festival, and the Care of Positive Employment Scheme, benefit carers across Scotland. The Scottish Government Carer Information Strategy funding to NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde is over £1,090,000 for 2015-16. This investment is contributing, contributing to a wide range of support to carers in Glasgow, including training for carers, young carers projects, and information advice service to carers in acute hospital settings. Bob Doris. Um, thank the Minister for that answer. Uh, Minister, Glasgow City Council is tendering out service provision at six carer centres across the city. The centres offer vital support such as information and advice, income maximisation and access to respite care. Minister, given that the Council's previous poor track record in matters such as adult uh, day centres for learning disabled and personalisation, can the Minister enter into constructive dialogue with the Council to ensure that the City is well prepared for the enhanced carer support which Council will be required to deliver following the passage of the Scottish Government's Carers Bill? Minister. Uh, well, President Officer, I am uh, aware uh, that Glasgow City Council has undertaken the process that Mr Doris has uh, referred to. He will appreciate, of course, that this, is not, uh, uh, this has been a decision the Council has taken. It is not one that the Scottish Government is directly uh, involved in. I am, of course, uh, very aware of the good work uh, done by carer centres. I visited uh, South East Glasgow Carer Centre uh, 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 last March uh, on the day we lodged uh, the Carers Bill. I saw uh, first hand the, the good work they are doing uh, locally. One of the uh, changes we have made to the Carers Bill with direct relevance to uh, carer centres at stage two is to make explicitly clear uh, that uh, where advice services exist, the local authority does not need uh, to recreate them. Uh, I can assure uh, Mr Doris in advance of the a bill coming into force, the Scottish Government will maintain a constructive dialogue with the local authorities, including Glasgow City Council. Question number seven, Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the value is of projects under construction or development in the Edinburgh area under the Hub South East Scotland programme. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Currently, there are 15 projects with a total value of £192.6 million, either in construction or in development in the Edinburgh area under the Hub South East Scotland programme. Lord Macdonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, the recent announcement of the £330 million of capital projects across Scotland includes £25 million for the Lothian NHS bundle. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the Firhill Partnership Centre is part of that bundle and is he able to outline the timescale for construction of this long-awaited new medical facility? Cabinet Secretary. 
I noticed within the uh, projects which I mentioned previously, two of them uh, are uh, the Cramon Primary School uh, and also Fox Covert Primary School, two schools which I attended. Uh, it's nice to see them being extended. But in relation to the health projects, I can confirm, I know the, the interest and the support of the member for that project uh, and recognise the work that he's done in relation to that, but I can confirm that the Fur Hill Partnership Centre is part of NHS Lothian's partnership bundle, construction of which is expected to start in 2016. Uh, until, until financial close itself is reached, I'm unable to confirm at this stage when the facility will be completed. However, it is estimated that the construction period would be around 18 months. Question number eight, Mary Scanlon. Do you ask the Scottish Executive how much it is overspent on its estimated ICT budget in the last five years? Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Officer, the ICT budget for the core Scottish Government has not been overspent in the last five years. Well, it's been Please well overspent on. in the last three months. Uh, in 2012, the Auditor, the Auditor General recommended the post of Chief Information Officer to develop support and improve cost-effective ICT services. Why did it take so long to fill this post? And why is so many hundreds of thousands of pounds of taxpayers' money still being wasted on ICT contracts, including £450,000 every month for NHS 24? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, Ma Mary Scanlon will understand that uh, <laughs> it's good to see the Better Together Alliance is still alive and kicking over there. Eh? Um, Mary, Scanlon, Mary, Scanlon will, Mary Scanlon will understand... Order. Mary Scanlon will understand that the, I, many of the ICT reforms that we have to undertake are complex projects. On the Common Agricultural Policy System, for example, there were substantial changes in the policy applied by the European Union after the original business case was put forward by the Scottish Government in 2012. Now, a, a reasonable-minded assessment of the fact that there are major policy and structural changes in a system of that nature, requires us to adapt our ICT challenges, principally, and Mary Scanlon will understand this point, because of the importance of guaranteeing compliance with EU schemes in the expenditure of public money, which is an, in, an issue of great significance to the Scottish Government and to the European Union. So uh, I understand and appreciate Mary Scanlon's interest in these questions, but I do assure her that these uh, issues are the subject of very clear uh, and a sustained investigation and management by the Scottish Government, both at ministerial and at official level, to guarantee that we utilise public money in an effective way to deliver for the citizens of Scotland. Question number nine, John Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met with the Council Leader and Chief Executive of North Lanarkshire Council. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, Ministers and officials regularly meet the leaders and chief executives of all Scotland's local authorities, including North Lanarkshire Council, to discuss a wide range of issues as part of our commitment to working in partnership with local government to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland. John Wilson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his response. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that the redundancy decision by Tata and the DL plant and Clyde Bridge plants and the indications from HMRC to reduce staff at its Cumbernauld office, tax office, along with the press comments by North Lanarkshire Council regarding potential redundancies as a result of local government budget settlements over the next year, would the Cabinet Secretary commit to establishing a roundtable meeting with elected members representing the area, along with the local authority and other agencies, to identify how we can mitigate against the economic impact of the levels of redundancies anticipated and in North Lanarkshire area. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, we are already involved heavily in terms of uh, addressing the issue around the Tata potential closure, and uh, my colleague Fergus Ewing in particular has been leading the way through the working party to make sure we do everything we possibly can to find a buyer, and he recently announced a subsidy of £195,000 to ensure that these uh, plants will remain open until we find a buyer. In terms of the wider issues, we will always be happy to work with all the stakeholders in North Lanarkshire and in every other part of Scotland where there are threats to jobs and the possibility of redundancies to try to ensure everything is done, first of all, to potentially protect such jobs, and secondly, if that's not possible, to find alternative employment for those affected by redundancy. Thank you. Question number 10 in the name of Nanette Milne has not been lodged. 
the member has provided an explanation. Uh, we are just moving right now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Kezia Duckdale. 